Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, another session of the Human and Health uh, webinar series at OU. Uh, today we're going to talk about healthcare professionals and vaccine hesitancy across the Americas. My name is Fabio de Sai Silva. I'm an assistant professor here at OU, uh, the College of International Studies, Department of International and Area Studies. I also co-direct the OU Center for Brazil Studies, which is involved um, in, in, in a project on this topic, as I'm going to uh, give more details later. Uh, and I have the pleasure of having with me today uh, Esther Paiva, who uh, is uh, an epidemiologist and public health researcher at Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, uh, a very high uh, uh, profile research institution in the Brazilian context, she's going to say more about this. Uh, and she is currently researching vaccine hesitancy and vaccine policy uh, in that country. I also have here Ryan, my colleague Ryan Yarnall. He's uh, an internal medicine physician and the medical director of the internal medicine clinic at the OU School of Community Medicine in Tulsa. And he's also working with us uh, in, in a project on, on these topics. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. And um, just giving you a little bit of the context of this conversation today. As I'm sure most uh, at the audience of this webinar series uh, know, uh, or you recently uh, drafted a new strategic strategic plan for the whole university, which translated into a specific uh, strategic plan for research. And the strategic plan for research is based on uh, what is conceived in, in the plan as uh, global complex challenges, including uh, what we've seen for the last couple of years, right, uh, which affected all of our lives, the emerging of infectious diseases and the rise of global pandemics. Um, in, in order to then tackle these complex and global uh, challenges, uh, what OU is now doing is to invest in convergent transdisciplinary research along four verticals, one of which is precisely the future of health. Uh, I guess the, one of one of the the uh, questions then, or or uh, issues that we are posed with uh, as the university decides to uh, move toward that direction is how do we put together an infrastructure for global research? Right? Uh, if we have challenges that are global, and if the knowledge to uh, face those challenges uh, also needs to be constructed in a global landscape, how do we move from uh, uh, how do we move beyond our campus uh, pursuing that? And this is where uh, the Center for Brazilian Studies comes in, in this specific conversation. The center, uh, which, as I said, a co-direct, is a hub for teaching, research, and outreach relating to Brazil at OU. And the way we work is basically through cooperation, uh, both within the university and between the university and Brazilian institutions or academic, groups of academics or groups of professionals to engage in a number of things, including uh, research in Brazil or about Brazil or having to uh, uh, do with Brazil as a comparative case study. So in this particular project that we are sharing with you some uh, uh, thoughts about today, uh, we are actually bringing together a series of very important uh, institutions in Brazil, including FGV, uh, the University of Brasilia, uh, but also Fia Cruz that, that's represented here by uh, Esther, the Federal University of, of um, ABC in Brazil, uh, as well as two different units here at OU, uh, our Center for Brazil Studies and the, the uh, OU Health uh, Tulsa that's represented here by Ryan. So how did this all uh, come about? Uh, in, you know, I, I, this is a, a quote that I like because it's usually how any scientific endeavor comes about, which is uh, through perplexity. And COVID-19 in Brazil brought a lot of perplexity. As we know, Brazil uh, uh, became 
you know, uh, a, a, a notable country in terms of how many cases, COVID cases it had uh, as of today, uh, more than 30.5 million cases were documented leading to uh, over 660,000 uh, uh, deaths. That's about four times more deaths than the global average, according to a 2021 study uh, that needs to be updated, but I don't think things will change a lot. And COVID in Brazil was also marked by uh, extreme politicization uh, and that a disdain for science, uh, including uh, all these measures that were indicated by the scientific community as important to find the disease, the use of masks, the use, uh, the, the adoption of social, social distancing, especially uh, in the first few days, and more recently vaccines, uh, which also took place at the high, highest levels of, gov of the government, uh, including the president himself. There was also a lot of misinformation and fake news. Uh, I know that this is very well known by the audience. Uh, and actually, there is a 45 minute documentary about this uh, that is available online. I'm just going to show you here uh, a minute and a half of it, which gives, I think, a very good picture of uh, how all these things came together to uh, really uh, uh, make a, a very tragic uh, scene in the Brazilian context. Falar para você que eu acreditava de uma vez, eu não acreditava. Então, eu achava que eu não pegava. Eu desci morrendo afogado no seco, me fechou a garganta. Tinha um dia que eu já comecei a fazer... E não vinha ar para mim. Eu puxava a barriga para cima. Eu começava, tocava a campainha, ninguém deu. Eu comecei a bater e gritar. E eu desci lá de cima, gritando. Eu abri a boca assim e não entrava ar para mim. Então daí eu comecei a acreditar e com muito medo e sério. Que ele existe e ele mata. Eu acreditava que isso aí era jogo político. Para querer derrubar o nosso presidente. Talvez se eu tivesse acreditado mais na doença, talvez eu não tivesse sofrido o que eu sofri no hospital. Mas eu acho que é difícil saber a verdade, mas só que a verdade está no mundo. So this is a very good documentary that, uh, again, I recommend. I think it was produced by Vice. Uh, I, can, I can leave the link for it uh, uh, later on the chat. And it's a documentary that I use in class to uh, show how uh, tragic, again, the COVID situation was in the country, but also how these different elements, these, these political and, and societal elements, uh, actually uh, uh, constrained a lot the ability of the country to find the pandemic, even though the country has, uh, I think, what is a pretty good uh, public health system. So, but as this tragedy on COVID in Brazil was unfolding, I, I actually got a lot of uh, colleagues here on campus interested in uh, not only understanding better what was going on in Brazil, but also comparing what was going on in Brazil with uh, the United States. So. I, and, I, and Ryan, who's here, was actually the, one of the first uh, uh, colleagues who reached out to me uh, with that kind of request. Let you know, let's talk about it because uh, I want to know better. And I think there are some interesting parallels to be drawn between the Brazilian case and the U.S. Uh, we also had a couple of other events uh, promoted by this uh, OU Center for the Americas, which is directed by my colleague Charlie Kenny, who is in the audience. Um, all of which you know, had the same goal of uh, trying to unpack the Brazilian case, but also 
begin to see uh, what similarities and differences uh, the Brazilian case has with the U.S. And that, that is, I think, a comparison that, that's very uh, worth pursuing because both countries actually had similarly uh, tragic outcomes. Uh, and these countries share some similarities and differences that uh, make them uh, uh, illuminating for uh, comparative uh, studies. So they're both uh, very large countries with, and they're multiracial democracies. They both have uh, high levels of inequality, whether it's social, racial, or regional. Uh, they had for a while uh, the same kind of leadership, Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump in the United States. But then there was a change in the US, uh, which makes the comparison interesting. They both have federal systems, but these systems are different. In the US, the states have more autonomy than in Brazil. Uh, and uh, the federal government in Brazil has better capacity to coordinate uh, public health responses or used to have. Um, and they have different approaches to public health. These are some, some of the things that uh, Ryan is going to address uh, later uh, when we get back to what we are doing today. Um, so given this interest on the OU campus uh, in terms of how the Brazilian COVID situation could compare to the United States and what could we learn from that comparison, uh, we then started putting together a project. And this project was, first of all, uh, uh, based on a research initiative that was being undertaken by uh, some of our colleagues in Brazil, especially those based at FGV and in, in the University of Brasilia, who throughout the pandemic, they did five online surveys with Brazilian healthcare professionals. Um, in, not, not just physicians, but also what we call their community health agents, agents, uh, nurses, uh, and, and other uh, professionals. These were non-random uh, sample uh, surveys, which makes the results uh, not generalizable, but they uh, each had over a thousand respondents. So it, 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 is a, uh, it, it made the studies uh, pretty robust. And uh, here we see some uh, highlights from publications that they generated, not only in Brazil, but also uh, more globally and in important places like the Lancet. And uh, I have slides here about the results from their surveys that I can talk more about. Uh, but I would really like to, to uh, share with you that our original plan was to replicate the Brazilian survey in the United States and then draw those comparisons, right? Uh, and uh, even, uh, in, and, you know, more than that, actually, to supplement the survey results and the, compa the comparative analysis of the survey, uh, the surveys with focus groups in both countries to uh, uh, deepen our uh, comparative uh, uh, analysis. So we got a grant from the VPRP's office and uh, their uh, social science and humanities and arts uh, program. Uh, however, we, uh, our attempt to replicate the survey in the United States failed because we didn't have enough responses, which is already, <laughs> I think, uh, an, interesting, an, in, an interesting fact for, for a comparison, right? Uh, I, I, I think it shows, for example, uh, how the medical profession in the United States is more fragmented uh, than the Brazilian medical profession, which could then be accessed through uh, the the uh, public health structure and, and um, involved in the research there, which we didn't have the same uh, uh, resource here to to tap on. But anyway, so we then engaged in an effort to uh, uh, replan uh, the, the the project. At the same time as the pandemic entered a new phase, a new phase, uh, we uh, if. During the first year or two, the uh, frontline response was the, the most uh, important uh, aspect of the pandemic. We are now moving onto a phase where uh, it's pretty much uh, a few uh, you know, measures that can be undertaken, which might include the use of, of masks, especially when we have uh, new outbreaks. Uh, we now have much more uh, and much easier to uh, use uh, testing uh, technologies. Uh, we now have some treatments uh, that have proven efficacy uh, against the disease. And uh, most importantly, we now have the vaccines. Um, 
And so we are now moving to study what role these healthcare professionals and especially physicians play or envision playing in promoting vaccines and what explains variation in these uh, envisioned uh, roles across the two countries and how the institutional organization of medical practice in the two countries uh, potentially shapes uh, these uh, roles that uh, physicians envision for themselves. To briefly explain how this uh, research is, is taking shape in the Brazilian context, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Stair to, to uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabio. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me see if I can pass. I'm trying to control. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Esther, and now I will continue to talk about the Brazilian context and the reasons to implement and expand the vaccine existence project, which now has the collaboration of Professor Fabio Smin. Uh, I will start by talking about Fiocruz, which was in the spotlight during the pandemic. Then I will briefly present the vaccine policy uh, project and finish with some initial research findings about the project. Uh, so, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation is under the Ministry of Health, and it's the most prominent institution of science and technology in health in Latin America. And we produce several kinds of vaccines, include AstraZeneca COVID-19. We have a role in education with postgrad courses and, and others. Uh, Fiocruz is also recognized as an institution as a source of reliable information especially related to the response uh, the, to the pandemic. Fiocruz also has frequently participation in the media. So as a researcher of Fiocruz, we have the support of its well-built trajectory to approach health professionals and get their participation in research. We usually don't get that difficult that Fabio said to reach the professionals. Um, Fiocruz has a lot of international cooperation over the world, but in our social science teams, our close partners are listed in this slide, and they were developed with a Hedge Zika social science network. I, I joined this network at 2000, 2019 to develop some qualitative studies to understand and manage the emergency uh, on an interdisciplinary approach. But with the COVID pandemic, we started to work in a development of a hub to expand the response and to invest in preparedness in health emergency in general. And now we conduct some projects related with COVID vaccine and vaccination. Uh, one of these projects is named the Vaccine Extensi and Online Misinformation Consumption among the healthcare workers. Uh, which the PI is Patricia Kinori from Oxford University. And she invited our team to investigate vaccine extensive in Brazil. And the project is also being developed in England and India, countries where the AstraZeneca vaccine was developed and authorized. We are conducting qualitative interviews and research with digital methods too. Uh, this study started through partnership with Oxford University and then expanded due to the great relevance uh, of vaccine existence in, is having now in Brazil. And as Fabio said, Brazil, um, it, it, it's, it's really easy to, to, to interview the professionals by the, the I forgot the name. I'm sorry. The healthy uh, for uh, through our health system, and and Brazil has one of the most extensive immunization policies worldwide, and it's integrated into the national health system. Um, recently, and we have and recently we have observed a drop 
in confidence and overall vaccination coverage, especially in, in children. And we know that in many countries, the political polarization and in health policy has been used as a tool for ideological dispute. And with that, the debate around the right to social protection and health is being put aside. Uh, the, the consequence of the dissemination of misinformation about COVID-19 vaccine is overflowing the distrust, distrust and examination. And that is the context our that project emerged. Uh, well, uh, so as I mentioned, this study uh, is expanded in the, was expanded into the Brazilian site. And here in Brazil is called the Brazilian Vaccination Policy COVID-19 Vaccine and Implications on Vaccine Existency. Uh, the study will be carried out in these five fields in different regions, Brazilian regions. And in this slide, we can see an overview of the study design. The, the first three sites listed were designed for the research with Oxford. And the last two, we introduced some modifications to facilitate the comparison with the fields that will probably be developed in Oklahoma. Uh, in this comparison, Brazil, USA, uh, one of the research objectives is to look the role of physicians and other health professionals in vaccination. What role they think they should play if they are advising patients to take vaccine and also if they are trying to mitigate the fears and misinformations. Then we will recruit more physicians in Sao Paulo and Brasilia and focus on the urban population. And we will use snowball sampling. I will anticipate some findings to explain why we are using mixing methods of sampling. Uh, because at this point, we only have started the field work in Rio de Janeiro, and we interviewed the public health professionals working in primary care in this city, where the local government encouraged vaccination. Thus, all reports collected are from health professionals who describe an active role in encouraging vaccination. So in the new fields, Sao Paulo and Brasilia, we will change the survey design to snowball recruitment. And with that, we are intent to recruit specialist physicians, such as pediatricians, geriatricians, or physicians who also work in private, uh, private health system. And we believe that it may bring different opinions to the study. Thank you. Um, so to, to talk a little bit um, about some issues related to the vaccine extensive and our initial findings, I brought up some of the questions uh, from our research script. And I will justify why they were thought of bringing data from our review and discussions in the research group. Uh, but first I would like to point out uh, uh, how dynamic vaccine research is we are starting field work in a different scenario where the importance, safety, and efficacy of the vaccine are much more established. Uh, we have to, we have answers and those is available, but we also have a lot of misinformation. And let me read the first two uh, as they are related. How, how, do you, uh, how do you understand the importance of vaccination? What about your family? What role do the healthcare professionals play in encouraging vaccination for COVID? Uh, in Brazil, uh, the importance of the role of health professionals is providing information about vaccination is well established, as well as their role on vaccination coverage. Questioning how they see their current role will help us to understand possible new reasons for existency. And then we asked more directly, in your experience as a healthcare professional, what do you think are the drivers for people to stop getting vaccinated and given the availability of the vaccine? Uh, here are some well-known reasons in the literature have been listed by the participants, such as fear of the uh, adverse reaction and also the idea that vaccine is no longer necessary uh, he, since the pandemic uh, and 
was established, was declared by the federal government uh, in April, and the number of cases is low. But we have more often seen doctors uh, sitting political uh, ideological affiliations as a reason for refusal. Again, uh, they talk about patients and their families, not about themselves, uh, because our interviews haven't come out against the vaccine at any point. And so we believe that like the doctors who public speak out against the vaccine in media, in the internet, these people who doesn't want to get vaccinated by political reasons feel represented by the federal government. Uh, and other questions. During COVID-19 vaccination campaigns, did you hear conflicting information, guidance for different management spheres, federal, state, local? If so, which one do you trust the most? Although this question was very specific about vaccinations, all the doctors who respond referred back to the time before the pandemic, uh, uh, before, um, and how helpless they felt to properly indicate a treatment and to do the risk communications. Uh, next, please, Fabio. You are helping me. Okay. So uh, the next question. We know that a lot of information about vaccine comes through social media and WhatsApp group. What do you consider to be the role of these media in encouraging or discouraging vaccination? I would just bring a data. In 2019, the Brazilian survey of 2000 interviews found that nearly seven in 10 Brazilians believe at least one factually inaccurate uh, statement about vaccine. 48% uh, reported having social media and WhatsApp as one of their main source of information about vaccines. And we believe that uh, with the pandemic, these statistics are probably much higher. And it's a really important topic to investigate. Uh, have you deal with guardians, parents, who have not yet vaccinated their children or have overdue dose for COVID-19, what do they say about it? Um, possible, possibly the, the greater influence of the anti-vaccine groups in Brazil is on childhood vaccination. Uh, current Brazil has only 28% of children between five and 11 years old with the second dose, and it's considered as extremely low adherence. And anti-vaccine groups have focused on positioning themselves against childhood vaccination, claiming mainly that the vaccine would have experimental character, several uh, adverse effects, and that natural immunity would be more potent than vaccine immunity. And this discourse is strengthened, strengthened uh, when the federal government states that the vaccine of children should be a family choice individualizing the issue to the family sphere instead of treating is a collective action. Uh, meanwhile, COVID-19 was one of the diseases disease that most victimized children in Brazil. And we have seen some case of hospitals and clinics dismissing uh, professionals who did, did not want to be vaccinated or made statements against vaccination. What do you think uh, about it? This was one of the questions inserted, uh, thinking about the extended script through discussions with uh, Professor Fabio Tin. Uh, we included the questions related to mandatory vaccination. In, uh, and in this new script, I did a protest and I felt a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty in the answers. Uh, on, the, uh, on one hand, everyone has a strong and formal opinion about the vaccine. But when we start to discuss issues of individual freedom and the position of the state or professional regulatory institutions, institutions the scenario is one of doubt and half words. But we are still in very early stages and I believe that Moving forward in collaboration study, the field here in, in Oklahoma, it will be very good and give us a lot of content to work with. And the next slide. Thank you. 
Now, thinking some thoughts and preliminary findings, the concept of vaccine hesitancy works with a continuum between total refusal and total acceptance for people accepting some blame for various reason, reasons. To deal with that, we seek community engagement strategies to combat fake news and misinformation, which has played a major role in vaccine hesitancy. We also believe that there's no point in just complaining about the fake news, internet, and the population over question, uh, because sometimes we, we hear physicians co commentaries in a tone of complaint. Oh, in the past, no one wanted to know who made the vaccine. No one questioned the numbers of doses, the FKs, FKs data, or asked about statistics. We believe that, uh, uh, we believe that we have to adopt, uh, adapt and not resent. We have to invest in health literacy. And for those who forget the vaccine or have some difficulty with the uh, operation hours from vaccine in health units, invest in vaccinations campaigns in the models, in the models in which was already performed which specific days and national mobilization, it's important and necessary. Uh, but to also reach those affected by misinformation, it's essential to invest in training, uh, training our health professionals and in a communication that consider our new reality of uh, infodemic. Uh, in Brazil, in finalizing about the role of anti-vaccine groups, uh, in Brazil, the first anti-vaccine association was created in 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's called the Brazilian Association of Vaccine and Drug Victims. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, these and other groups had a new form of engagement. Uh, the reason was that the federal government, uh, represented by President Bolsonaro, adopted positions contrary to vaccines, inducing the population to have the immunity from contagion. Feeling represented in the federal government, the anti-vaccine groups in Brazil have gained great relevance, although not compared to USA or Europe. These groups in Brazil do not have much dif diverged content from the global north. They focus on vaccine safety, claim the manda that mandatory vaccines attack individual freedoms, generate emotional appeals, and advocate also alternative treatment. Uh, meanwhile, there are some current peculiarities. And vaccines group often feed uh, on populations uh, low trust in, in state. However, in the Brazilian case, the anti-vaccine groups currently find their discourse within the state. Uh, the anti-vaccine information is mainly uh, on social networks like Facebook, WhatsApp, and now uh, in Telegram. Therefore, it's a uh, it's common to notice that many of these groups also make pro-Bolsonaro propaganda. And that's interesting to note that with the high adhesion of the vaccine by the population and with the proximity of the presidential and legislative elections uh, this year in Brazil, these groups are now dissemination political propaganda and positions in favor of uh, the current federal government. So people who gain notoriety with and vaccine speeches during the pandemic in Brazil, and some of them are physicians, have been declaring that they will run for the elections. And in a notorious attempt to give this ideology a, a standoff in power. Uh, so uh, I think that that was, I wanted to tell, tell you. And um, Ryan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I need to be unmuted. Um, thank you, Esther. And um, I wanted to um, just remind uh, the attendees as well, if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please place them in the, the Q&A box and, and we can address them here in a few minutes. Um, and so Esther gave a, a great overview of the research 
currently being uh, undertaken in Brazil, uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers and particular physicians. And um, I wanted just to take a few minutes to look at that from the United States context and uh, what we hope to gain from uh, this research that we're, that we're undertaking. Um, traditionally in the United States, there's been a, a lot of studies that have been done looking at what is the most trusted source of health information. And what we have repeatedly seen is that physicians, uh, particularly primary care physicians, are usually the most trusted source of any sort of health uh, information, including vaccines. And um, a lot of times, you know, the public health uh, sector has looked at physicians as possible interventions and possible targets um, in order to uh, disseminate uh, correct health information. And in my own clinical practice, I've actually experienced this multiple times um, where I'll have a patient who is vaccine hesitant for various reasons. Um, and I'm able to sit down, have a conversation with them uh, in a non-judgmental way and, and um, kind of hear what some of their concerns are and hopefully address a lot of misinformation. Uh, sometimes I'm able to sway uh, or convince them to get the vaccine, sometimes not. Um, but a lot of times the response that I do get from these patients are uh, that they do not trust the government, they don't trust pharmaceutical companies, but they do trust me. So they don't necessarily associate me with the medical establishment per se. Um, so like I said, primary care physicians a lot of times are seen as, as the guides. Um, but I apologize. What if this source um, varies in their opinions or in the type of information that is uh, being dispensed uh, to patients? And we've seen that uh, a few times uh, throughout the past two years of the pandemic. Uh, within the United States. And this has been something, uh, a research question that has been asked by a lot of people. And um, uh, there's been surveys that have been con conducted nationwide. Um, one in particular that was done uh, had asked physicians, uh, primary care physicians, but also physicians in other uh, practices as well, um, you know, uh, what their thoughts were on the vaccines, particularly the COVID vaccine safety, efficacy, and importance. And what they found was fairly surprising. 10.1% uh, of the US physicians surveyed uh, neither agreed nor disagreed, somewhat disagreed or strongly disagreed that the COVID vaccines were safe. 9.3% um, did not agree that the vaccines were effective. And uh, only 67.4% strongly agreed that the vaccines are safe. So less than 70% of physicians. Um, Interesting to note is of these physicians that were surveyed, um, only 5% were unvaccinated. So they themselves, the, the rate of unvaccination was fairly low and um, that could possibly due to mandates at institutions that had occurred, but um, it's hard to say. If we were to take this data and have a conservative estimate and extrapolate it to the American Medical Association's database of primary care uh, physicians, there's a possibility that uh, potentially 25,000 primary care physicians nationwide disagree that vaccines are safe, um, which is uh, something that is surprising and, and concerning at the same time. And I think the thing to know is, you know, as a, as a doctor, we are people too, you know, and we are embedded within our own context and associate with uh, uh, various groups. And we're subject to the same type of information as people in those groups or um, reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And uh, this could be anything from political messaging. Um, as you can see, Republicans uh, have been shown to um, become a little bit more vaccine hesitant, whereas Democrats uh, are a little bit more open to vaccines. Um, there's a fairly big difference there within the United States. Um, younger people uh, tend to be more vaccine hesitant as well. Um, you know, that might be a perceived risk of serious COVID um, back real quick here. Um, younger people, oh. um, younger people might be seen as, you know, a COVID infection. They have a lesser risk of serious COVID infection or sequelae, um, serious sequelae. And so they might be uh, more vaccine hesitant in that case. 
And then, of course, um, distrust of medical establishment, which, um, you know, we see with uh, historical injustices that had uh, been um, done by the medical establishment to certain groups, such as African Americans, um, can all play a role. And, of course, there's also the uh, erosion of, of trust a lot of times that can occur uh, over time. Um, you know, one example I've used uh, is drug pricing. Um, you know, we see a, a lot of patients um, not able to afford medications or procedures uh, due to prohibitive costs and lack of insurance coverage. And they might see pharmaceutical companies or insurance companies in that case uh, not have the patient's best interest in mind. And then, of course, uh, physicians, we are, uh, we receive the social media messaging as Esther was kind of detailing in Brazil. Um, uh, COVID misinformation is fairly rampant throughout social media, and they might be subject to the same type of influence as the general population as well. And so the question really is in the United States, as well as in Brazil, is what is the role um, that physicians play in uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy? And then if they do feel like they have a role in um, discussing vaccines with patients, you know, is it the same type of information that each patient is getting or is it accurate information that the patient is receiving? And so that's, you know, a, prim a primary reason why we wanted to conduct uh, this type of research and look across the United States and Brazilian context. Um, because we wanted to see, you know, what are the consistencies that uh, are across both the political, social, um, and institutional um, forces that physicians live and work within um, that might be driving uh, vaccine hesitancy or um, how they view the role in addressing vaccine hesitancy. So for instance, some of the social, political, and, and this has been touched on earlier in the talk, um, but COVID-19 misinformation is um, throughout social media and it's amplified in both countries by leaders at the national level uh, as well as local levels. Um, there's various vaccine mandates, patchwork uh, throughout both countries um, and their legal challenges as well. And then a growing partisan divide that we, that we see in, in both countries. And then uh, within the healthcare and institutional systems themselves, um, we have in both countries a marriage of a public and private system. Um, you know, in the United States, we have uh, public insurance such as Medicaid, Medicare, we have the VA, the Veterans Affairs uh, Health System. Um, and then in Brazil, the Unified uh, National Unified Health System too as well. However, there's starting to be shifts in opposite directions to my understanding, you know, in Brazil, um, there has been underfunding of the public health system, which is um, a lot of primary care is, is performed through the public health system. And then the United States, you know, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, over the past decade, there's been more conversation about shifting toward the public system. Um, Medicare for all has uh, been um, a conversation that's been had happening uh, quite recently since the presidential election. Um, in both countries, we've seen inadequate investment and shortage in primary care. Um, and uh, also in both countries, a lack of equitable access to specialized services as well. And in Brazil, um, there's various philosophies uh, towards healthcare, but uh, healthcare is uh, embedded within uh, the constitution um, as a constitutional right. Whereas in the United States, we've traditionally uh, seen healthcare um, as a, a privilege, you know, based on free market principles, although that is something that uh, is starting to shift as well. So, like I said, looking at uh, both of these contexts and, and discussing with physicians, you know, what are some of these underlying drivers um, could hopefully give some good insights into, you know, what are some of the things that we can, um, focus on not only in vaccine hesitancy, but also any sort of uh, health information uh, misinformation. And, um, you know, this is going to be important as social media will not be going away anytime soon and, and sort of information channels that we um, are dealing with as health professionals that we haven't historically. And so um, with that, I wanted to uh, go ahead and
end the slideshow, but I wanted to um, now uh, open it up for uh, questions. And um, I'm going to go ahead and read the, the first question um, to, and we'll, we'll address it as a group here. But this is coming from Dr. Carmen out of Tulsa. And he states, is there any data you are aware of that compares rates of hesitancy of receiving COVID vaccine to influenza or other common recommended vaccines? Such data would seem to be the best filter for influences of politicians, traditional media, or social media. Esther, do you want to um, see it in yeah, Brazil if you have any answer to that? Yeah, I have an answer uh, thinking about the Brazilian context. Uh, the, the research on vaccine extents in Brazil address more aspects uh, as accessibility and national coverage and vaccine extents defined according to who uh, has been researched more recently. And there are some papers on the influenza vaccine. Uh, the, the strategy of associating the influenza vaccine with the COVID vaccine has been fought right now but it, it's not yet implemented. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the influenza vaccine is only for priority groups here in Brazil as elderly children and health professions. So I, I don't have any data and we are anxious to, to have the, the data of the uh, actual campaign, but uh, that, that's all that I know at the moment. Yeah, if I can just wet, add one thing, um, or, or maybe two. So I, I think that's a great question, uh, uh, John, because uh, what uh, I guess, you know, here in Oklahoma, for example, we had a state law that was passed that prohibited uh, higher education institutions, for example, from uh, mandating uh, uh, vaccination for COVID, but only for COVID, right? Or you continues to, uh, uh, especially I guess for international st students at least, uh, continues to to uh, require that they come here uh, and that, that they bring all their their vaccination, um, um, uh, their proof of, of of vaccination for all the other vaccines that uh, are considered to be needed. So uh, it is indeed very, uh, you know. This, this is very much around the COVID vaccine, but I do think, and maybe Esther has, has some uh, anecdotal evidence of this or even uh, numbers, but I do think that the hesitancy that has been created around the COVID vaccine has spilled over to other, other vac vaccine, uh, types of vaccines as well. Uh, the last time I read something about this in Brazil, it showed that the rates of vaccination had declined for a number of other diseases that actually Brazil had a very good performance uh, in. So I, I don't think we have data, but uh, I, I have some uh, level of confidence about uh, the potential impact of this uh, campaign against the COVID-19 vaccination that has been undertaken by uh, these groups and in some cases, uh, political leaders on other kinds of vaccines as well, which leads us to a potentially a very gloomy future, future uh, in terms of you know, some diseases that Brazil had eradicated or had uh, uh, been able to keep very much under control could, could come back. So um, I will also add to that, you know, I mean, in the Brazilian context, uh, I think it's similar with the United States. And uh, like I said, I don't have uh, studies in front of me, uh, but, I um, will say that vaccine hesitancy is nothing new. Um, you know, this is something that's been around for a long time within the U.S. I mean, I, you, you can even read a lot about the uh, flu pandemic in the early uh, 20th century and vaccine uh, hesitancy that had occurred uh, or, um, or masking, um, you know, that not necessarily vaccine, but masking that um, was a lot of resistance to, to those types of measures that are being done at the uh, flu pandemic. Um, but I will say that the, the difference now is the amplification of certain messages too, as well, um, through social media channels and things like that, that we have. And so, um, something like, like a flu vaccine, people might've always been resistant to it, but then if they see several messages, 
uh, about the potential adverse effects of the flu vaccine through daily throughout social media messaging, um, they may become more resistant at that point. Yes, and just to add what Fado said, I just read a, a, a recent, a, a new, a new, in, that in that half of a thousand kids in Brazil hadn't uh, have the polio mobility, the polio vaccine, and this drop is occurring uh, in other vaccines too. And we don't really know uh, in which spectrum uh, of extensity. It's, it's the accessibility. It's because in the last year, the mobility was lower. Uh, we don't know, but we know that there's a lot of extensity by refusal too. Ryan, do you wanna read the next question? Yeah, so um, this one is probably more geared towards Esther. Um, as of early April 2022, uh, these countries had these excess dates per excess deaths per 100,000 persons. So for Peru, it was 654, Mexico 554, Bolivia 497, Ecuador 448, Argentina 374, Brazil 369, El Salvador 368, USA 354, Colombia 349, um, all the way down to the Dominican Republic, which had 69. And based on these data. Um, Brazil had a high excess death rate, but one far less than Peru, Mexico, or Bolivia, and similar to Argentina, El Salvador, or the U.S. and Colombia. What, in your opinion, might explain this relative performance? Oh, maybe Pablo can help me. Let me think. <laughs> I mean, I would say that you know, despite everything that Bolsonaro did. Uh, the Brazilian public health system still worked, uh, you know, yeah. to the best that it could. And actually part of the data that, that we have from uh, the survey, right, it shows that uh, the healthcare professionals, they were, they were uh, uh, very much um, um, fearful and insecure about how to handle the pandemic, but they did their best. And uh, one thing about Brazil being a federal a country like the United States, although with some differences, uh, was that federal and uh, state and local governments could still mobilize their health systems to uh, fight the pandemic. And they, they could still uh, adopt some uh, measures that were uh, restrictive of, of people's movements. Uh, that actually went to the Supreme Court because Bolsonaro wanted to centralize the entire response at the federal level, which, which uh, would mean a lack of response because his philosophy was to, you know, uh, uh, go on with normal life. That, that's the, the expression that he used. Uh, but, and so the, the states got from the Supreme Court the backup that they needed to continue to uh, deploy their health systems as well as to adopt those measures. But that also means, and this is one of the key uh, issues that we discuss among the Brazilians, that there was a lot of inequality within the country because some places were more successful than others uh, in terms of uh, reducing the uh, or keeping some control over, over the death rates. Uh, and some place, places were really, um, you know, did a really uh, bad job. And not surprisingly, there is actually a, a study that we published through uh, the OU Center for Brazil Studies, uh, there's, a, there's a, a correlation between uh, cities that highly supported Bolsonaro in the election and a uh, higher uh, number of deaths. I'll, I'll post the link to that study here. So we see that uh, playing out. I think I was in conflict because as a public researcher, this would be my answer. But as an epidemiologist, I, epidemiologist, I thought, oh, maybe it was not considered because we had a lot of more exit rate of death. And we know that that was, uh, uh, th that was passed by flu, just flu or, or uh, respiratory crises. And we know that we didn't have tests in the beginning of the pandemic and maybe can be like this too.
Right. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in the beginning, it was, it was really it, it was really a bad response overall because the states and, and local governments didn't know what to do either, right? They, they were actually seeking guidance from the federal government because this was usually the way it worked. Uh, and that's the difference between the Brazilian federal system and the U.S. federal system. Uh, uh, the tradition had been that the federal government had this coordinating role that it played, right, uh, in um, acting in conjunction with states and, 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 and in agreement with states and, and, and municipal governments. Uh, but after a couple of months, uh, as this wasn't happening, then state and local governments had, had to uh, take this uh, with their own hands. Any final question from the audience? Ryan, Stair, do you have any question for each other? Uh, I will say I, I did want to just comment too on on a little bit on that last conversation just briefly because um, you know we talk about uh, and not only how the Brazilian and U.S. healthcare system is set up, but also the responses um, due to that and very similar. And you can see kind of those excess death rates pretty similar between Brazil and the United States, um, where you have an, an impaired response due to a lack of cooperation or not necessarily cooperation, but um, uh, systems in place for the federal government to uh, work uh, closely with the state governments in terms of public health response. Um, you know, one thing that we had seen, you know, we, we look at um, the excess death rates per states within, in the, within the United States and we see variation as well. Um, but earlier on, um, you know, uh, certain states had a much more, um, uh, much higher mortality rate uh, due to COVID, but that was likely due to where it hit first and then kind of how it came across. And so uh, ideally, you know, that, that might even be that uh, excess death rate might even be more exasperated because by the time that it hit a lot of these um, states that had higher excess death rates, we should have been more prepared at that point. And so um, that is another thing that um, I wanted to comment on and that is very similar across both the contexts. Yeah. And the same results, I guess. Okay, uh, we have... Uh one or two minutes left. Uh, we were asked to end it punctually at 1 p.m. I just wanted to use uh, those uh, two minutes or 90 seconds to thank everybody who attended, to thank everybody who is going to be watching this later, uh, to thank again the uh, VPRP's office for the invitation to uh, be able to share with you what we are doing, uh, and also to say that, that we are gonna need some student help uh, here uh, in Oklahoma to pursue this research in the fall. Uh, so if you know of a friend uh, or, you know, can be graduate student or maybe a good undergraduate student who is willing to help us uh, in this project, we have some resources, uh, who is willing to help us, especially conduct those interviews in the fall, because we are now finalizing the uh, questionnaire uh, and refining the questionnaire and, and getting IRB uh, approval for, for the questionnaire in the two countries. Uh, but then in the fall, we really hope to go uh, to uh, the field and to talk to these professionals and to understand all these questions that were uh, posed here by uh, Esther and Ryan uh, in greater depth. Uh, and like Janet was saying uh, before this, this, sem this webinar started, um, I really hope that this is going to be the beginning of a promising collaboration between different sectors here, uh, here at OU and uh, our uh, dear Brazilian institutions. Thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone.